So let's get the meeting started uh, with uh, Andy and this guy this month. Hello, uh, my name's Andy Beaton. You have probably seen me do this uh, a few times. For those who haven't, I'm an amateur astronomer who lives and observes in downtown Toronto. If you want to know what it's like observing 50 feet from a streetlight, I'm the person you can ask. So I get to do the sky this month for this month. And we uh, have my usual list of uh, favorite subjects, the big picture, key dates, moon, planets, something in the deep sky, a double star, a variable star, and whatever is happening in the world of spaceflight. So starting with the big picture, if you're out tonight, by the time the meeting's over, you get home, you set up your telescope, 1045 is a reasonable time. This is what you should be seeing. You should be seeing a few, star, a few planets out there, our, uh, Spring constellations are sinking into the west, but we can see Venus and uh, Mars just above the horizon there. Venus, you'll see a lot of it because uh, it's visible well before twilight. Uh, we have a few minor planets uh, visible. Um, Ceres is probably visible to uh, a normal human being with their telescope. Uh, the other guys, they're there for academic interest. By the time we get around to our next meeting, uh, 4.30 in the morning of that day, when we look to the east before sunrise, this is what we're going to see. We're going to see all the planets you can stand. We've got Saturn, we've got Jupiter, we've got uh, Uranus and Neptune out there. There'll be a full moon for the next meeting or something very close to it. And we'll get all our favorite summer constellations there, and a few of our favorite fall constellations uh, showing up uh, just before sunrise. And if you take a look right in the bottom left corner of the picture, there's Orion sticking his nose up, a sign that uh, winter is going to come eventually. So nights are getting longer. Uh, this is good news for uh, us, bad news for people who like staying out late on patios. Astronomical twilight is going to end 20 after 11 tonight and start again at uh, 2.50 in the morning. This is all uh, daylight savings time. So you don't have a big window for your long exposures. Um, by the end of the, uh, the month, it'll be more like 10.30 when things get dark and uh, 3.45 when things are light enough to get in the way. Important dates. The important date, of course, is the new moon, July 17th. That's where we're going to get our best sky. Uh, moon is at apogee, which is far, and perig on July 20th, perigee, which is close, on August 2nd. Uh, interesting project I always like to uh, suggest is take pictures of the moon at those two dates and compare them. You can actually see a difference in size, which gives you a rough idea of how uh, eccentric the moon's orbit is. Full moon on August 1st. It's not the superest moon we're going to get this uh, year, but it's pretty super. It's pretty big and close. It'll be very bright. If you've got uh, friends and family who are easily intrigued by this kind of thing, uh, tell them about it. Um, people love supermoons. Uh, Venus will be minus 4.7th magnitude on July 7th. Uh, you're going to not be able to miss it. You'll probably see it through clouds. And we have a meteor shower showing up the uh, South Delta Aquarians in uh, late July. So the moon, uh, first quarter on the 25th, uh, full moon on August 1st. Uh, last quarter on July 10th and the new moon on the 17th. Um, July 25th, we have the appearance of the lunar X. And what we have there is uh, two craters side by side on the moon. And when uh, the sunlight hits them at a certain angle, it looks like there's an X on the moon. It doesn't mean anything scientifically, but it's cool. And it's a good excuse to uh, haul your telescope out and have a look at the moon. Uh, July 26th is the appearance of the lunar straight wall. It's a long straight feature on the moon. And when it's illuminated at a certain angle, it uh, shows up very beautifully. 
So we've got planets. Uh, Mercury will be showing up in the uh, evening later in the month. Right now it's just getting past the sun. Uh, Venus is insanely bright. It's uh, as bright as you'll ever see it. It's up to, I say, minus 4.7. It'll be brighter than any planes you see flying around. You won't be able to mistake it. Uh, Mars is uh, going to be a disappointment. Um, people who are desperate to see Mars will be able to see it, but it's not going to be showing any detail. You're not going to see any surface features or ice caps. It's too far away and too low in the sky by the time it gets dark enough to see it. Jupiter, you know, if that's not everybody's favorite planet, it's your second favorite planet. Uh, rises just after midnight. Um, anything before dawn in the morning, you're going to have a spectacular view of it. Saturn is rises a bit earlier. It'll rise before midnight, and it'll be more or less in the same part of the sky throughout the entire month. Uh, unfortunately, the rings are closing compared to last year, and it'll be closed more closed next year. So. If you want to see the rings at their best, um, you're going to have to wait for the cycle to go through, but uh, get out and see them now while they're still better than they're going to be. Uranus and Neptune, the ice giants. Um, Uranus is in Aries. It rises a bit before Jupiter in the morning, so you'll be able to see it uh, at any morning observing session. Uh, Neptune rises a bit after midnight. Um, both of those planets are going to be as good as they usually are for viewing. They're on the right side of the sun. They're, if they're not the closest they're going to be, they're pretty close, and uh, you'll have a pretty good view of them. Uh, if you're looking for Neptune, uh, try for Neptune's uh, brightest moon, Triton. Uh, anything larger than an 8-inch telescope should be able to manage it with decent skies. There's always a typo in my presentation. This says planetary highlights, and it should say dwarf planetary highlights. Uh, Pluto's in Capricornus. Um, it's getting away from the Milky Way. It's at opposition on July 22nd. If uh, it's your ambition to see Pluto, this is the best time to do it. Uh, it'll be around well into the fall, but uh, this is going to be as bright and close as it gets. Ceres, uh, the big asteroid in Virgo, uh, it sets by midnight, but uh, at 7.5 magnitude, it's a, you should be able to see it with a pair of binoculars under most conditions, and it's moving around fast enough that it's an interesting project to uh, track. Uh, get a sky map, print it out, uh, and mark it uh, day to day and see the asteroid moving around the, the, its orbit. I always like to throw in a bit of deep sky stuff. Um, this month I've picked M27, the Dumbbell Nebula, a large planetary nebula in uh, this constellation Volpecula. Um, it looks more like an alpha core to me. I think it was named by someone with a lousy telescope because the cheaper your telescope, the more it looks like a dumbbell. The better your telescope, the more it looks like an apple. Here, that's, that looks more like an apple to me than a dumbbell. Under dark skies, you can see it with binoculars, but uh, the more aperture you throw at it, the more spectacular it gets. What we're looking at here is a shell of gas being expelled by a dying star. This is the probable fate of our sun once it uh, runs out of fuel. So if you want a sneak preview of uh, what we're going to see in another 10 billion years or so, uh, this is your big chance. And I'll throw in a plug for Messier certificates. It's uh, number 27 on the Messier list. When you've seen them all, you uh, send in your uh, list to the uh, RASC and you get a fancy certificate and a pin and a sense of accomplishment. It's a, a pretty cool project. Now, if you're a more advanced observer, you've seen M27 before, but uh, you may want uh, something more challenging to do with it. Uh, it can be imaged with uh, different narrowband filters, oxygen-3, silicon-2, or is that sulfur or silicon-2? I never remember. 
hydrogen alpha, get different images in different colors and combine them to make fascinating colored images. And with narrowband filters, you can do it in the city. You can look for the 13.6 magnitude central star. Um, I haven't seen it yet. It's just a bit out of reach for my telescope. But uh, anything, say, 10 inches or better, you should be able to see it. And anybody doing imaging, it should be an easy find. There are bright knots in the gas uh, near the edge of the south-southwest lobe. And there's my typo for the uh, presentation. And if you are patient and have a nice dark sky, you can image the faint outer shell. If we take a look at this image here, it doesn't even show up. It's uh, probably double the size of it, very faint. Um, and as far as I know, never been seen visually, but it does show up in long images. As always, we've got uh, comets and meteors showing up. Uh, our best meteor shower is the uh, South Delta Aquariids from July 25th to August 2nd. Peaking on the 29th, they're promising us uh, 20 meteors an hour. Um, that's always variable. Uh, unfortunately, it's under a mostly full moon. So you may get uh, lucky and see the bright ones. I wouldn't count on seeing the dim ones. So. Realistically, I would call that more like uh, five meteors an hour than 20. But what you can always do with meteor showers is uh, set up your shortwave radio, tune it to uh, dead air, and when meteors pass through the upper atmosphere, you can pick up radio stations from thousands of miles away as the radio signal bounces off the ion trail that the uh, meteor leave, leaves behind. We've got some minor showers, the July Pegasids and the Alpha Capricornids. Um, these are small showers looking, you know, three or four meteors uh, an hour. I wouldn't bother going out specifically to look at them, but if you're out observing and you see a meteor coming from a strange direction, um, trace it back to its origin and see if it's one of these uh, minor showers. And the meteor dribble is even less. That's maybe one or maybe two meteors per hour. Um, there are lots of uh, these little meteor dribbles. I've just thrown in a couple, just so you know that they exist. And if you're out there and observing, you might see one. Comets, it's uh, not a particularly good month for comet looking. E1 Atlas in Ursa Minor is the best one. It's uh, currently 9.6 magnitude and fading. Um, comet uh, T4 Lemon is 10th magnitude and sculptor. That's for you observers in the southern hemisphere only. I was I was extremely delighted to find there were people uh, listening to me talk from in the southern hemisphere, and all this southern hemisphere information suddenly became useful. Uh, C2020 V2 ZTF in Aries, and a couple of dim uh, panstar comets in Lepus and Pisces. If you're a dedicated uh, comet searcher, they're probably worth tracking down. If you're looking to impress people with a spectacular comet with a long tail, eh, it's not so good. And a couple of months ago, I added in Aurora here because we had been promised a big auroral display, which uh, we got a display of clouds instead around here. But I kept it in here um, just to point out that right now things are pretty quiet on the sun, not a lot of uh, activity. So we're not going to see a lot of spectacular auroras in the immediate future, but there's a whole month of us ahead. So I'm going to point out uh, spaceweather.com um, as a source of information for upcoming solar events, um, aurora predictions and maps where we can expect to see the aurora. As a inspired by uh, Blake Nancaro, I hope you're out there watching Blake. Uh, I've got a double star for you. Uh, Kruger 60. This one's uh, not an easy one to see. This one's going to take a bit of work. You'll need a telescope for sure. Uh, a 9.9 .9 and 11.4 pair of red dwarfs in Cepheus. 
Now, what I found interesting about this is it's got a 45 year period. Uh, if you start observing now and keep observing for the next 45 years, you will see them complete an entire orbit, which means if you're watching from year to year, you're actually going to see movement. You know, I, we've all seen a lot of uh, double stars where they're thousands of astronomical units apart and will never get anywhere close to being observing us observing the move. But uh, this one's gonna be a really good target. They're currently 2.4 arc seconds apart. That's close, but it's not as close as the, uh, the pairs in, uh, in the double-double in Lyra. So it is, it is splittable with a reasonably large telescope and you want a lot of magnification thrown in there as well. The B star is also a variable star. Every now and then it uh, flares up, doubles in brightness over an eight minute period, and then dims back down again. And it's entirely unpredictable, so if you are going to be out observing and you see that uh, that 11.4 magnitude star is a lot brighter, uh, get onto your uh, computer and uh, report it to the people who need to know. I couldn't uh, do one of these presentations without talking about variable stars. That's my thing. I, I love them. I can't help it. Uh, I picked RR Lyrae uh, this month. Um, it goes from 6.9 to 8 magnitude, and it does it fast. Uh, the period is 0.57 days. It's a, an interesting one from a, a physics point of view. Uh, helium gets ionized by radiation blasting out of the, the star and becomes more and more opaque. So more of the light from the star, the energy from the star gets trapped inside it. Star heats up and expands. Once it heats up and expands, there's less uh, radiation uh, zapping the helium. The ionization trickles away. The star becomes more transparent, the heat uh, blasts out, and the star collapses again. It's uh, interesting scientifically because this is the standard candle for measuring distances to globular clusters. And that's one of the uh, footsteps to measuring the size of the universe. So it's a really important thing for a scientist to understand. And in fact, uh, our own Helen Sawyerhog uh, made a career. She founded her career studying RR Lyrae stars in uh, nearby globular clusters. So it would be a tribute to her to uh, go out and see if you can uh, spot some of these guys. Now, as always, the American Association for Variable Star Observers wants your information. They want you to go out and observe this, measure it, and report back your findings. It's quite simple. You uh, download a map. It gives you all the comparison stars nearby. You look at it. You say, OK, it's dimmer than that seventh magnitude star and brighter than that 7.5th magnitude star. It looks like 7.3. That's all there is to it. And you're generating genuine scientific data. So we have another variable star, obviously, SN2023 IXF which I'm sure you all recognize, or as you, we know it better, the supernova in M101. Uh, currently, it's around 12th magnitude, so it's definitely a telescope object, and it is slowly declining. I think it's gone down half a magnitude over the past few weeks. This is another chance to uh, get some science in and have a look at the brightest supernova we've seen in years. And once again, aavso.org is where you can find all the details, uh, maps of comparison stars, and everything you need. Coming up in spaceflight, um, we're always getting new stuff from JWST. We have an uh, Antares rocket with an ISS cargo payload uh, flying from Wallops Island, Virginia, not California, not Florida. Um, this is a brand new spaceport. Um, if you're observing from the east coast of the US, you probably have a decent chance of seeing this one launch. We have the Japanese X-ray Imaging and Spectroscopy Mission. Uh, exact date to be determined, but uh, it's on its way up. 
uh, more Falcon 9s than you can shake a stick at, and a lot of ISS passes. Uh, we've got evening and morning passes until July 21st, and then it's just evening passes until August the 2nd. Heavensabove.com uh, gives you times and locations for uh, ISS passes according to where you live, because as you can imagine, it doesn't take much of a difference in location to change the times and uh, places in the sky, you'll see the space station. And one other thing that was uh, in the news, gravitational waves. Um, I've been observing my weight carefully. I don't think it's been changing a lot. It seems to have changed by at least one in a quadrillion parts due to uh, primordial gravitational waves, uh, which generally seem to be everywhere we look throughout the universe which tells us it's something from very, very early in the uh, universe's uh, life. Um, there, are, there is no confirmed explanation for it yet. The best explanation I've heard is that there are millions of supermassive black hole pairs in the early universe, and as they rotate around each other, they blast off gravitational waves like nobody's business. This is one where you're probably not going to observe it yourself, but it's definitely worth uh, keeping an eye on the uh, on the internet and see what news is coming out as uh, this weird and interesting phenomena gets studied more. So, as it was, what if it's cloudy or the sky is filled with choking clouds of smoke? That's those have been my choices for the past few months. We have zooniverse.org with a heap of citizen science projects. This is, these are projects where scientists don't have the time to gather all the data for the vast numbers of observations they need to make. They're farming it out to you and I. So you go to the website, pick a project, and start classifying data. Uh, there are dozens of projects I've picked for just because they looked interesting here. Uh, cool Neighbors, a brown dwarf search, Brown dwarves are stars with just not enough uh, mass to ignite. They just have gravitational heat. Redshift Wrangler, measuring redshifts of objects in space. Fishing for jellyfish galaxies. They're weird galaxies, and you can Google them to find out exactly what they're all about. And cloud spotting on Mars. Going to uh, images of Mars, looking for clouds, trying to uh, get a good grip on Martian weather. This is all stuff where you and I are contributing to real science. So if there are any questions, uh, corrections for the typos that I've missed, um, I can be emailed at uh, andy.beaton at gmail, and I'm on uh, a few of the social media places as well. So thank you very much.